after a frustrating string of losses to kick off the 2023 Nebraska football season, my friend Connor Hayden on Corn Crazed expressed a wish of his that Nebraska football would play it safe on offense and be mean, aggressive, and play at an NFL elite college football level on defense. And while the offense, even when they tried to play it safe, continued to turn over the football throughout the year, in fact, they finished with a worse scoring offense than the Iowa Hawkeyes, and the special teams, unlike Iowa's, was not stellar, the defense played their part. Nebraska's defense finished 13th in the nation in opponent points allowed per game, only allowing 18.2. And Nebraska was ahead of teams like Texas A&M, Tennessee, Auburn, Kansas State, James Madison, Louisville, and just behind Utah, Oregon, Georgia, and Missouri in defensive efficiency. Nebraska was 19th last year per ESPN's Football Power Index in defensive efficiency. Meanwhile, they were 91st and 110th in special teams in offensive efficiency. Nebraska's defense tried their best to carry the team last year. Nebraska's defense, the Black Shirts, were essentially the EpiPen to an offense and special teams unit that was constantly, almost purposefully, running into a nest of bees, knowing that they themselves were allergic to said bees. But besides the analogies, what I want to talk about today is this Nebraska defense turns returns rather a lot entering 2024. And can this unit be an elite unit? Can it not just be among the best of the best in the Big Ten, but nationally? Can this be an elite Big Ten defense, perhaps even the face of of all Big Ten defenses nationally. Welcome back, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam. And before we dive in and talk about Nash Huttmacher, Tommy Hill, Tony White, Matt Rule, and all things Nebraska football on this episode, please smash that big red subscribe button to show your support for Big Red. Go Big Red. And make sure to click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release more Nebraska football, Big Ten football, and college football content. I made in a community post about a week, week and a half ago that in the final week toward the end of February, there would be more consistent content coming your way, including a way too early top 25, and before then, way too early Big Ten record predictions. So hit the notification bell if you want to get notified when that content drops, along with any future Nebraska, Big Ten, and college football content. Like this video, comment your thoughts on Nebraska's defense next year, or actually it's this year, rather. Still trying to get into the mode of 2024 and out of 2023, but it's challenging. And comment your thought as well to the fact that Nebraska's Nine of their projected 11 starters on defense are going to be seniors. This is going to be a veteran-laden defensive roster. Comment your thought on that down below, your reaction to that. And lastly, if you want to support the channel while also representing Nebraska football, or if you're not a fan of Nebraska, any other Big Ten university, you can check out my merchandise page via the link in the description or the pinned comment. And if you want some occasional once-a-week bonus content along with supporting the channel, you can check out my Patreon page and sign up as an All-American or Heisman member of my Patreon. Again, via the link in the description and the pinned comment at the top of the comment section. This defense last year was vicious. It was not without faults, but having a defensive coordinator coming over from Syracuse the starting and rotational lineup being littered with young players, littered with players which Scott Frost and Eric Chenander seemingly ruined in 2022, all of that combined didn't exactly give me the feeling that entering 2023 Nebraska was going to have the defense that they did. Well, outside of games against Colorado and Michigan, where the Cornhuskers allowed 35 points or more. They allowed 36 against Colorado and 45 against Michigan. The next highest point total that they allowed 
all season outside of those two games was against Wisconsin, allowing 24 points on the road against the Badgers in overtime. Wisconsin scored 23 and a half points per game last season. So they scored their average total per game against Nebraska in one of Nebraska's more inferior performances on the defensive side of the ball all season. The Cornhuskers, the fact that they held Colorado to 36 with the amount of turnovers they had was, I would say, impressive. They held Northwestern to nine points. They held Illinois to seven points. They held Purdue to 14. Maryland, a team that actually had a competent offense, in fact, dare I say it, an above-average good offense, they held them to 13. It was the offense, not really the special teams, though the special teams didn't really help or hinder the team as a whole. They were more of a neutral. So the offense, the turnovers, the pivoting and game plans later in the season, the play calling, specifically quarterback play, that hindered this Nebraska team. Nebraska was 5-3 and three entering the month of November, and they proceeded to go 0-4. But the defense being a top 15 unit in scoring, scoring is the most important offensive or defensive category, only allowing an average of 4.6 yards per play, averaging 3 yards per carry allowed on the ground, and less than one rushing touchdown per game allowed. Those are impressive numbers. The secondary had their moments of weakness, that's for sure, whether it was against Maryland with some deep balls allowed, against Michigan with their wide receiver core that was very underrated wide receiver core last year. Colorado tore them apart at times. Minnesota's Daniel Jackson was able to get some good looks, but all those whether players or groups that I mentioned were good, great, elite wide receiver cores. So no harm, no foul in year one. Now it's year two. Matt Rule, Marcus Satterfield, Tony White is in year two. Most of the staff is in their second year. There were a few staff additions, of course, but Everyone who Rule wanted to retain has been retained. And Tony White, the fact that, you know, he was, he had some connections to that UCLA head coaching job, at least I believe, that speaks volumes. Same with how when the San Diego State job opened up, there were some people connecting those names there too. Tony White is going to be a head coach one day. And to retain him as the defensive coordinator for another season, on top of returning close to four-fifths of their defensive production from last year, which is ninth in the country, is insane. And this defense is ranked sixth in Bill Connolly's preseason S&P Plus numbers. There are some other defenses that are ranked inside of the top ten there. Georgia's is fifth. The fact that in preseason S&P Plus, which adjusts for talent, adjusts for past performances that Nebraska's defense is expected to be in the realm of Georgia's is nuts. Ohio State is one. Michigan, despite losing the majority of their starters in production, is two because they have a really good defensive system and they recruit and develop well on that side of the ball. Nebraska, again, this is preseason projections, but let's have some fun here. They are ahead of teams like Texas, Alabama, Ole Miss, Notre Dame, Florida State, Utah. They are even ahead of Wisconsin in defensive S&P+. And in terms of returning production, they're ninth. Again, returning 78% of their defensive production from 2023. A little bit of a side note, the offense returns 76% of their production, which is 23rd nationally. But in the preseason, while... Nebraska is ranked 6th in S&P Plus defense. They're ranked 115th in S&P Plus offense. I anticipate a lot of that is having to do with Chubba Purdy and Jeff Sims transferring out. Heinrich Harburg did not have a good year last year. And Dylan Riola is unknown from a college standpoint. He was a five-star. I think that he is going to be a good college player, as most five-stars are. But we simply don't know. Nebraska's offense was so, 
it was so bad last year. I thought that the offense was going to be the better half of the ball last year, and boy, that was an awful, smelly, milk outside in the sun for seven days type of prediction. It was, in fact, the opposite. It's good that the Cornhuskers return most of their D-line, in fact, all of their defensive line, and most of their defensive backs. And they do bring in two defensive transfers, and I imagine there's a chance they'll bring in more when the spring portal window opens. I believe it's from April 15th to April 30th, I believe. If my memory serves me correctly, if I'm wrong, comment down below. But I wouldn't be shocked if they didn't either, because this unit is deep. The two deep is impressive. The starters are senior laden. Again, nine out of 11 projected starters for the black shirts will be seniors. This unit will be very experienced. They'll be mature. They'll be physical. Let's check out the way too early depth chart provided by ourlads.com. On defense, left defensive end, Ty Robinson, nose tackle, Nash Huttmacher. Right defensive end, Jamari Butler. Jack, which is really a hybrid linebacker defensive end spot, Stefan Thompson. He's transferring in from Syracuse. At the linebacker spots, we have Jevin Wright and John Bullock. At secondary, we have Kobe Bretz, Tommy Hill, Isaac Gifford, Deshaun Singleton, Malcolm Hartzog. Those are the five starting defensive backs. Quinton Newsom and Omar Brown leave from defensive back, and Luke Reimer and Nick Henrich leave at linebacker. Linebacker is the spot where a lot of the production drops off, but there are returning contributors like MJ Sherman, ja- um, Javin Wright, John Bullock, Prince Ruel, Uman Milian, and there's incoming production in Stefan Thompson. And at the defensive line, Huttmacher had a breakout year in 2023, and Ty Robinson and Jamari Butler, and also Cameron Lenhart, who had a good year with three sacks as a true freshman, they come back. The secondary spot had weaknesses, but Tommy Hill was one of the better rated corners, according to Pro Football Focus, with around a 75 overall rating. Isaac Gifford, true senior. I say true senior because he has no redshirt. He's been a contributing player all of his years at Nebraska. Deshaun Singleton wasn't healthy for all of last year. Marquise Buford Jr. also comes back. So there's good depth. And Bly Hill, who's transferring in from St. Francis, looks to be a backup true sophomore at corner. So there's depth here. There isn't just good starters, but you better not hope you suffer an injury, otherwise the whole thing falls apart. The good teams, more so the great teams, the near elites and the elites, they have depth. Michigan is a prime example of this. Last year and even in prior seasons in 22 and 21, Michigan's O-line last year was not an elite unit. It was worse than the 22 and 21 unit. It just was. But when Zach Zinner went down with that injury and Carson Barnhart had to shift inside at guard and the O-line had to be revamped, they played their best two games against Alabama, who had a vicious pass rush, and they project protected J.J. McCarthy and ran the football in an effective manner for parts of the game. And against Washington, where Michigan ran for over 300 yards and adequately protected J.J. McCarthy, that was because of Michigan's depth at the position. It's not because they had five Cooper BBs or five Zach Zinners or five Cedric Van Prans, and they just bullied people and never got injured. The the, the offensive line, as most O-lines do, that's a position that's suspect to injury, they had to face adversity. But they went through it, they powered through it, and they have good depth. They recruit well there, and that's part of the reason, spoiler alert for Michigan fans, why I think they'll have a good O-line again this coming season. Nebraska has this defensively. I don't know about every position, but I think at secondary, they're great there. I think at defensive line, they're good. I think at the jack position, they're good. Linebacker? whether it's traditional MLB or WLB, I don't exactly know. But the defensive line in the trenches and in the secondary, which was Nebraska's weakness defensively last year, 
Those are great positions, great places for rebound and further growth to have that much of your production returning. So this sets up Nebraska fairly nicely, I would say. Let's talk about some key pieces, people who had breakout seasons last year and those who I think will be contributing further in 2024. Nash Huttmacher had a great year, and I remember how great of a year he had because if you follow Corn Craze, who I mentioned earlier in the video, you should subscribe to his channel if you haven't already, though I imagine if you're a Nebraska fan watching this, you have to be subscribed to Corn Craze to, right now. Otherwise, it, it, it's, it, it's heresy if you're in a, a huge Nebraska fan and you haven't subscribed to Corn Craze. All jokes aside, though, Every time Huttmacher got a sack, I forget this guy's name, but he would he would super chat, corn crazed. He'd super he'd super chat a big amount of money. So there was this incentive for Con for Connor to to really cheer on Huttmacher to do well, not just because he's a Nebraska fan, but because he got rewarded for it. Huttmacher had four and a half sacks, just casual four and a half sacks, forty total tackles. Two passes defended. Big physical guy. He's dominating in Nebraska wrestling right now. 6'4", 330 pounds. Going to be a senior. Really impressive player, and I think he'll be better this year with a another preseason under Matt Rule strength and conditioning, learning more about Tony White's scheme, maturing. He he's not a freshman going to a sophomore, that's typically where I think you see a lot of growth by the time that you're already a senior. In a lot of cases, you have what you have, but you never know. And Huttmacher, if he's going to stay the same as he is last year, you already have a, a great nose tackle, a great defensive tackle. But I think that because of the fact that he was in a new system last year and he still excelled, I expect improvement off of a 2023 breakout season is really what he had. Is in 2022, he didn't have a single sack, only 40 total tackles, no passes defended. His best game was against Northwestern, where he had two and a half sacks and seven total tackles. He had a half sack and a pass defended against Iowa and a pass defended against Michigan State. Wouldn't be shocked to see him pass five sacks, six, dare I say it more than that, and maybe get more total tackles and probably a forced fumble as well, given how hard he just gets in there and gets hits. He can stop the run and he can get pressure. Linebacker's a different story. I can't tell you right now someone who I'm expecting to, to step up and be a key piece. Speaking of the new NCAA football game, which a trailer for that dropped, and I haven't even watched it yet because my interest in video games in a general sense, has declined. But going back to NCAA, I'm going to get that game. In fact, I intend to play it and make a video about it on this channel when it comes out. You know those players where when you select them, they have that star? I don't necessarily know if there's a player like that at linebacker, at least yet. Reimer and Henrik were the two highest-rated linebackers for Nebraska last season. They're both gone. And yes, I do think that John Bullock and Javin Wright are going to be good players, but I don't know about key players. I think that someone, whether it's those two, whether it's Stefan Thompson, someone will have to step up in that room. Secondary is where things really get exciting. This could be Nebraska's best group on the entire field, and that includes what should be a loaded running back room, a tight end room that will include close to a five-star incoming, Thomas Fedoni, Nate Borkacher, and Luke Lindenmeyer, and a wide receiver core that with Jamal Banks and Isaiah Nayer coming in and Malachi Coleman and Jalen Lloyd having good moments, that's going to be another exciting room. Also, a defensive line that returns all of their production and has players like Nash Huttmacher, Ty Robinson, and Jamari Butler. But this secondary, despite their faults last season, also had some great moments. Tommy Hill had four interceptions last season, a fumble recovery, nine passes defended, and 26 total tackles. 
Isaac Gifford led the team in total tackles with 86. He had eight passes defended. He had an interception, and he had a half sack. And then Malcolm Herzog, or Hartzog rather, six passes defended and 40 total tackles. Quentin Newsom had 37 total tackles, three passes defended, and an interception. He will certainly be missed. The fact, though, that of all those players that I listed, Gifford, Hartzog, and Hill are all coming back, that's impressive. That's really good. And Deshaun Singleton returns as well, and the incoming transfer, Bly Hill, it'll be a good addition. So this room, for its faults last season, particularly in defending the deep pass, could be the best group on the defense and for all of Nebraska football. I'm excited and I'm getting more excited talking about this defense. The the longer this video and segment, whatever you want to call it, goes on. And as I've already stated in previous videos, this schedule has a lot of opportunity. There are going to be plenty of traditional rivalry games for Nebraska to play in, and their schedule is extremely favorable. Extremely favorable. Their, their first road game is at Purdue last week of September. And their first game against opponent, an opponent who I think will be better than them from a raw talent standpoint, is Ohio State in the final week of October, the 26th. Road game, probably not going to be a win, but Ohio State was offensively challenged for their talent last season. I mean, in retrospect, I look back and part of me thinks... How could I even give that offense praise last year? It was because of Marvin Harrison Jr. and Travion Henderson, and McCord was, I think, better than most OSU fans ever gave him credit for. But they were really challenged and underperforming. And if they have another year like that again, which, by the way, is totally possible, there's no guarantee that Ohio State's somehow going to be better than they were last season, even with their incoming transfers, they're only 70th in returning production, and we don't know if they'll improve on the offensive line. And the areas where they're building up to be better, like running back and defense, really weren't problematic last season. I mean, Will Howard is just a substitute for Kyle McCord with athleticism. That could be really good. That could be a compliment. That could also be an insult, depending on how the rest of the offense works out. I mean, Nebraska, with this defense, I could see them, if Ohio State's offensively challenged, making that a game in Columbus. Now, do I think that'll happen? We'll see in my way-too-early Big Ten record predictions, because I might include scores with those, though likely not. That'll likely come in the following month or two when I will release monthly updates to all of these. But to get back on, on topic, what I was really trying to say is... You have a nice, you're, you're nicely walking into the pool. It's not like LSU Florida State last season where you dive into the deep end and kind of walk yourself out of the deep end and the schedule gets easier as the year goes on. That's not what's going on here. It, it's the opposite for Nebraska. You get to lean your way and slowly submerge yourself into the pool and then you have to dunk your head under the water late October. And then that's when you really see, can you tread water? Can you hold your breath? Can you swim laps? And I think this defense can do that. But the other question, the biggest question really is the offense. Um, but some other players, mainly breakout players or incoming transfers to look at. Look at Cameron Lenhart, Stefan Thompson, and Bly Hill. Lenhart had a big freshman year, and I expect him to break out in 2024. He had three sacks in 2023, and that was in a true freshman campaign. He also had 16 total tackles. He, along with Huttmacher, big guys. I mean, Huttmacher's about 80 pounds heavier, at least, according to last year's information. But Lenhart, 6'3", 250 pounds, 
from Staten Island, New York. And being a younger player, you're going to see a lot of growth this year and the following season if he's still with Nebraska's program, and I expect him to be. I think he'll break out in 2024. What does that mean? I think it's too early to say, but he'll have a better season than he did in 2023 for sure. I'm confident in that. Stefan Thompson is transferring in from Syracuse, and Bly Hill is transferring in from St. Francis. Bly Hill was a true freshman for the St. Francis Red Flash. He had 21 total tackles, two interceptions, and five passes defended. 6'3", 165 pounds. There's not even a game log for him on ESPN because St. Francis is that unknown of a school. I don't even know if they're FCS. I think they might be, what, Division... Division, no, I think they're FCS. They're in the same league as Duquesne. So that means I think that they're FCS, but still very unfamiliar school for my territory. He's young. The fact that he's coming to Nebraska and was offered, I think is already indicative of the type of player he is. He'll be in the rotation, and I think there's a great chance that he starts because with Omar Brown and Quentin Newsom leaving, there is definitely an opening. For him to start. Stefan Thompson is already projected to start according to rlads.com. He had 51 total tackles, one and a half sacks, and a forced fumble last season. 6'1, 248 pounds. He's projected to play at the jack position, which means that he will be more of a pass rush edge linebacker. So many key pieces for this Nebraska defense. A lot of potential, a high ceiling, a high floor. Once again, I think it's the offense that you have to look at. I think Nebraska will have an elite defense. I think that's I think that's going to be the case. And with Bill Connolly projecting them with his S&P Plus model to be top 10, and Nebraska being ninth in returning production on defense, they were top 15 in scoring defense last year. They were top 20 in efficiency. With the amount they're returning retaining a solid defensive staff, and the fact that we know from Eric Chenander and Scott Frost, who never at Nebraska fielded a defense like the one last season in terms of raw numbers and efficiency, we know that this wasn't a fluke. We know that last year's defense wasn't the byproduct of Chenander building an awesome talent pool and developing these players at an extremely high level and then he was collateral damage, and a new DC you know, takes over and thrives in a system that was built for him. That is similar to a Brady Hoke situation taking over for Rich Rod at Michigan, where Rich Rod built up an amazing offense, and all it took was really just having a competent DC, a good DC in Greg Madison, to pair with that awesome offensive talent, and you had a fluke year under Brady Hoke that made him look really good in 2011. That's not what's happening here. This defense was developed and retooled and repurposed in one preseason by Matt Rule and Tony White. They will be an elite unit. They will be top 10 this coming season. But I think that the defense will once again carry the offense. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean the offense is scoring under 20 points per game? I don't think it'll be that extreme. But I can tell you going back to the schedule that you're probably not scoring on Ohio State. I can say that with players on the offensive line like Turner Corcoran, like Teddy Prohaska, like Bryce Benhart, these are players who are old, who've been in the Scott Frost system for years. I think that there's a chance that some of those players are just, they're broken. And that's not really in a more mental way, that's in a developmental way. Frost did a terrible job developing the O-line, and I do think that the offense is limited. Plus, not from a developmental angle, but from a youth angle, Dylan Riola will probably not come out and be anything more than an above-average quarterback at best in year one. Look, look at Quinn Ewers at Texas. When he started, I know he was a, a, red, a redshirt freshman, but really he was too young to even be considered to play for Ohio State when he did when he was there in 2021 and enrolled early. He was really the age of a freshman. Much better supporting cast. Much better offensive play caller. Much better talent pool. Easier conference. 
And there were times where he sucked, to be frank. That's what happens when you're in your first year of starting and you're a young player. Now, I also think that Quinn Ewers, from a recruiting ranking standpoint, is particularly overrated, but that's a personal opinion I have that I can't exactly back up with mountains of evidence either. So to be safe, I'm going to apply that rule of experience matters. It does. Michigan, Alabama, in t- Michigan last year in Alabama in 2020, and LSU in 2019 are an example where a lot of experience plus a lot of talent, the pressure, the experience, it, it created a diamond. And you have experience almost in a negative way due to the development of Scott Frost on parts of the O-line. You have inexperience at quarterback, tight end, running back. I think those positions are great. Receiver is a question. We talked about the defense for most of today, but I want to touch on the offense just to give that perspective that I do think the defense in a large capacity or in some way is going to be the much better half and is going to carry the offense next year. And games against Colorado and Ohio State, and heck, maybe I'm insane for saying this, but I even think Rutgers, obviously at USC, those are going to be games where this defense will be tested. USC, it's Lincoln Riley, it's Miller Moss, They're using the portal well, and they have Zachariah Branch, so he'll test your special teams too. Ohio State has too much talent and a new play caller and a lot of experience returning on the O-line and at running back. I think they'll be good on offense. Rutgers is returning one of the Big Ten's best rushing attacks. They're returning four to five O-line players. Kyle Manungai, they're returning Gavin Wimsatt most of their wide receiver core, and most of their defense, too. Rutgers is in a similar position to Nebraska, where they're top 10 in returning production. Rutgers is 8th. They're 6th in returning production on defense. And Rutgers is projected overall by S&P Plus, just as an example, to have the 17th best defense and 94th best offense. So there are teams, I actually think, I think that metric is very much underrating probably both Rutgers and Nebraska on the offensive side of the ball, but particularly Rutgers as they have more experience at the quarterback position and a much more seasoned, superior offensive line. But you get the point. Nebraska will have an elite defense. Sorry about that extra E. I mean to have that in there. But the defense will once again carry the offense. How many wins will that produce? Again, you'll see what I think in my way too early Big Ten record prediction video. Thank you all so much for listening. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I release more college football content. I am going to have, or at least get in contact, though I imagine Connor will say yes, I am going to try and have Corn Crazed on my live show very soon, but I'm getting all of that worked out and I'm only going to get back to doing lives once my consistent content flow has been active for a week or so. So expect probably in the middle of March for me to start going live consistently again, but thank you for being on. And before we end this video, thanks to Crash2488 and Justin Rogg for being Heisman patrons. Thanks to Spencer Bringhurst and Armani Torres for being All-American patrons. And thanks to Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, Austin Christmas, Zubinza, and Janisha Cockrell for being All-Conference patrons. Remember, Heisman members and All-American members get access to my weekly, just, just once a week though, bonus content. And the bonus content for this week will be dropping, I'd say, within the next two days. It'll probably be in a written blog post discussion type format, which is what I did one on about a week and a half ago discussing Penn State and Ohio State and the comparisons between them. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all soon. Bye-bye.